I think the challenging assumptions topic or theme for this conference is quite appropriate when you look at diabetes because um, we find that in review of the evidence-based guidelines, there's very little evidence-based research in the area of end-stage renal disease, dialysis, and diabetes. When we look forward and see that the growth of type 2 diabetes around the world is rapidly increasing and up to 50% of people on dialysis do have diabetes, it begs the question, why is there not more research and information to guide us in how to properly manage these people? And with respect to peritoneal dialysis, it's really, really important, I think, that we start to look at the role that glycemia plays in the longevity of the peritoneal membrane and how perhaps we can contribute to prolonging people's time on this very cost-effective therapy. Sharon and I, as Lori alluded to, are very, very uh, fortunate whoops, to work in, in an environment where we have access to many, many, many uh, experts in their own fields. We work with nephrologists, dietitians, pharmacists, social workers, peritoneal dialysis nurse specialists, and we also consult with endocrinologists and family doctors in the community. So we have a wealth of people to support us. Um, this, this slide is mostly to, to just remind us that we're all working in an environment that really is um, chronic life support. And in doing so, we, we do not have a lot to guide us in chronic life support management of patients. This is our team. I'd like to just start by reviewing some of the guidelines, the clinical practice guidelines that we do base our therapeutic strategies on, highlight um, what information they do give us, and probably a larger portion of that is what information they don't give us. And then we'll go on to talk a little bit about the characteristics of diabetes and chronic kidney disease, primarily stage four and five, and on into dialysis and look at more practical aspects, glucose patterns and targets, um, some other practical aspects of hemoglobin A1C and self-monitoring and assessments and how we use that information to design strategies. Talk a little bit about the role of glycemia in the peritoneal membrane and talk a lot about the drug therapies, some of the things that we do and primarily based on a experience rather than guideline and then also highlight the importance of cardiovascular risk when we're working with people with on dialysis and diabetes. There's a whole host of clinical practice guidelines. Many of you are familiar with many of them. The list is here. It's not the only ones but I'd just like to step through a few of them and highlight what what they tell us. So the latest version of the C Canadian CPGs um, did make some substantial changes that maybe help us more in the dialysis world. Um, it, aside from focusing on screening and managing diabetes, preventing complications in a non-kidney disease population, um, it did give us targets, but what it did do is give us wriggle room. So rather than focusing primarily on everybody's A1C being under 7%, it did highlight the importance of factors that contribute to the need to individualize therapy. And so now they have given us a range, and we can even go up to 8%. And in cases, there may be a case made to, to say that an A1C could be higher than 8%. So they're starting to recognize different comorbidities um, that cause us to change the, the therapies that we choose. Whoops, wrong way. KDGO does not give specifics, but it did, what it, it did do, try to do was bring together advice from many different other bodies with guidelines, and um, it did focus on specific use of diabetes drugs in chronic kidney disease. 
Kedoki, similar thing. It did talk a little bit about diabetes drug use in stage four and five kidney disease. It talked about interpretation of the hemoglobin A1C, which Sharon will spend a little bit more time talking about, and how they, that is not always the most reliable indicator of glycemic control in end-stage disease. And again, it came back to hypoglycemia, which is um, a consistent theme throughout all the guidelines and how it becomes very important in management strategies to be aware of a person's risk and prevent risk when we can. The ADA standards um, that just came out in 2015 also talked a lot about hypoglycemia. They talked about the role of albuminuria and hypertension in management strategies. And they did focus on the role of glycemic control in our CKD patients um, as part of overall CVD risk management. They recommend referral to nephrology when GFR is less than 30. They discuss the variables, again, contributing to um, A1C values. And they set some, some targets that are similar to, to uh, the Canadian guidelines. They also mention the role of real-time continuous glucose monitoring and the use of insulin analogs. Uh, similar in the previous version of that in 2014. This was a really helpful study that um, was, came out in 2011 um, by Blake et al. and uh, Dr. Bargman was part of that. And again, it paid some attention to the role of glycemic control and um, exposure to hypertonic glu glucose solutions and how they affect ultrafiltration and ultimately the function of the peritoneal membrane. So this isn't something that we've seen in the diabetes guidelines mentioned elsewhere, but it is more of, I think, something that we need to pay attention to. They did also say that few data exist to guide the management of diabetes in the peritoneal dialysis population. They do recommend that where possible, we do adhere to clinical practice guidelines, but recognize that there's many times when we need to perhaps step away from them. So in diabetes and chronic kidney disease, we see that things start to change as kidney function um, worsens. In uremia, we know that the entire metabolism, carbohydrate, protein, and fat metabolism changes. And because of electrolyte disturbances and mineral metabolism disturbances and changes in, in in hormones like insulin, glucagon, and other counter-regulatory hormones, it becomes more challenging to control glycemia. In stage four and five, we tend to see that there's more insulin resistance um, due to the factors listed here. And there's also prolonged action of many of the metabolic medications, including insulin and, and the oral hypoglycemics that may be renally excreted. And this becomes more prevalent once the kidney function gets under 20%. So this leads us to the question, what do we do in this situation? And I'd like to hand it over to Sharon now. She's right here. Yep. So I think it's obvious um, after Pat's uh, introduction there that we can apply clinical practice guidelines based on diabetes uh, studies some of the time but not all of the time. All the time we have to be considering how kidney disease impacts diabetes. So what is missing when we look at the clinical practice guidelines? Much is made of the fact that insulin, there's a prolonged duration of action and uh, delayed degradation related to renal atrophy. Um, are, is everybody still awake? I <laughs> know this is, this is rather dry stuff, but if you feel like you have to stand up and yawn, go right ahead. If you leave, I'll be upset. <laughs> so what is missing? When we talk about changes with kidney function, the diabetes uh, data seldom discusses the role of the kidney in glucose metabolism, and I'm not sure why. We certainly all know, particularly 
those who graduated before 1970 that we had, to, remember we had to test urine for glucose? The kidney gets rid of excess glucose. Mostly when you mention it now, they think of the new drugs that help the kidney get rid of excess glucose, but before we had to test. We also know that the kidney participates round the clock in renal gluconeogenesis. So gluconeogenesis is the use of protein molecules, amino acids, lactate, and glycerol to create new glucose. The liver is inhibited in its role of creating new glucose by excess action of insulin, but the kidney is not. The kidney will keep on working around the clock. It responds most to adrenaline. We're missing a practical treatment model for diabetes and renal disease. We're missing really well-researched target blood glucose ranges. And I'll explain more about that later. Uh, we can't use four to seven as a preprandial goal in people who have a postprandial state that lasts 16 to 20 hours. They're seldom preprandial. They're mostly postprandial. Lab meter comparisons are also skewed in peritoneal dialysis, and of course, we're missing research. I was listening to Dr. Schwartz this morning talking about how if we were to do more peritoneal dialysis starts with acute kidney injuries, we could maybe generate more funds that could go elsewhere. So we would like to be elsewhere when it came to the funds, that is. So why is glycemic control important? Our population has increased risk of hypoglycemia because they have no renal function to speak of. They have increased risk of hyperglycemia because we use glucose solutions. They have increased risk of glucose variability because they don't have a stable background to support their glycemic status. And they have an inflammatory response both to hyperglycemia and to the glucose-containing PD solutions. And despite that, many of them do very well, so we must all be getting something right. Hypoglycemia is the classical treatment limiting factor. Recovery from hypoglycemia is impaired with kidney disease. Renal atrophy is big. There is a, a paper out by a gentleman named Noel Cannell, C-A-N-O, who investigated the hyperglycemic response to profound hypoglycemia. So of course it takes several hours. Profound hypoglycemia here, 12 hours later, blood sugar is 25 to 30. He estimates that over 50% of the glucose in the blood after a profound hypoglycemic event is derived from the kidney. That's not something that we talk about in diabetes. We assume it's mostly from the liver. And as you know, severe hypoglycemia can have actually quite profound adverse effects. This is from the veteran study in the United States. And over on the left-hand side, the second column from the left, you can see that people who do not have kidney disease but have diabetes are at greatly increased risk for blood glucoses under 2.8. If those people also have chronic kidney disease, that risk more than doubles. Saying that there's a prolonged action of insulin, even endogenously produced insulin, is not the whole answer. So if we exclude the model of glycemic, renal glycemic function, I love this line, it fell out of my mouth one day. We're looking for lows in all the wrong places. We have to <laughs> look for lows any time that we're counting on the kidney to help keep the blood sugars up. This, of course, is based on people who do not have diabetes. These authors were pointing out that most of our day is spent in a postprandial state. Postprandial meaning that we're expecting an influx of glucose via the gastrointestinal system. So all those orange areas are uh, postprandial. I'll get to this when I talk about lab meter comparisons. That nice green color is the only time when we're really fasting in this model. Meter companies want us to do lab meter comparisons in a fasting state because that's the state when the meter result and the venous result are similar. Obviously, what we do is then generalized an accurate lab meter comparison of fasting state 
to a day of postprandial and postabsorptive state. So even when people don't have chronic kidney disease, I question how accurate that is. When we do get the occasional result that says the meter said uh, 25 and the lab said 15, then often you look at the time the blood glucose was drawn, and it's within half an hour of eating. Meters can't um, adjust for that because we're talking about physiology. We're talking about delivery of glucose to the capillaries and delayed delivery of glucose to the veins. When do we need insulin? This is the model that we use for diabetes. It's assumed, of course, we need insulin when we eat a meal. I usually explain to people that basal insulin, <clears throat> in this instance, is lantus, those blue lines, is kind of like replicating what the pancreas does 24-7. It's a little drip of insulin, like a dripping tap, all day long, all night long. And then when we eat meals that contain carbohydrates, we turn the tap on temporarily, and we secrete a whole bunch of insulin. So this is the model. Those green lines show rapid-acting insulin, trying to adjust for absence of insulin for meals, and lattice insulin given at bedtime to adjust for loss of basal insulin. Our patients are different. The production of glucose overnight is called gluconeogenesis. Also, we break down glycogen, but gluconeogenesis becomes more important the longer we fast. And often when we do these lifestyle assessments, this is pre-care, this is before dialysis, we find that people, yes, they have carbohydrates, breakfast, lunch, supper. They've heard they don't need food at bedtime, so often they're telling us, no, I never eat at bedtime. You'll just gain weight when you do that. But if I ask them about overnight, usually I ask, yes, how often do you get up to go to the bathroom? Not teria four or five times, but by 4 o'clock in the morning, I'm really hungry, and I have to have cereal and milk a couple times a week. So, but they don't test their blood sugars. <laughs> So that's why I've written query, low blood sugar. The morning blood sugars with that kind of pattern usually vary from very low to very high, higher when they've had the cereal and milk, low when they've managed to sleep through. And then the afternoon and evening blood sugars are higher. We aim routinely for blood sugars of 10 to 12 at bedtime, just to, so there's enough sugar to last the night. We have this insulin on board theory that came from insulin pumps. Pat and I have been calling it glucose on board. You need a little glucose on board to last the night because we can't count on the kidneys to keep your blood sugars up. Glucose patterns in peritoneal dialysis, much is made of hyperglycemia because of the glucose in the dialysis solutions. We also have to look for low blood sugars. We have a unique use of diabetes drugs because we have to accommodate hyperglycemia and prevent excessive prolonged action of those drugs at the times when people are most vulnerable to low blood sugar. So this is an example of a woman who's currently, she's just been in our clinic for a couple of months now. She is insulin resistant. Most of our people are quite sensitive to insulin. She's taking very large doses for someone, of insulin for someone in kidney disease. She has Humalog 40. Now she's up to 56 units per meal. Uh, type 1 diabetes, you can often get away with 10 to 15 units a day when they first go to dialysis. So it is a huge amount. You can see she's lower in the morning. She, at this point, she still had extra needle at nighttime. Her rapid-acting insulin dose is twice that of her basal. With diabetes, we're often aiming for 50-50, but she has more glucose intake during the daytime and less overnight. I have not included what we call insulin to carb ratios. If you really like math, start reading about that. It's, yeah, it'll keep you awake. It doesn't do anything for me, but might do something for you. <laughs> but we do do insulin to carb ratios. The problem with perineal dialysis is that Yes, we can, after a PET test is done, we can estimate how much carb people are getting from the dialysis solution, but we can't estimate how resistant to insulin they're going to become based on a continuous influx of glucose. The rest of us 
have glucose coming into our blood from food for six, 12 hours a day, but it's intermittent. These people have glucose coming in from the solution for either eight hours overnight or 16 hours during the daytime. And that changes how the insulin works. Their body um, creates a resistant state. This person, this is an example of a cycler assist program. Uh, this person is taking Lantus in the morning and you see that I've moved the Lantus here to supper time. Why? Well, the person has no glucose input from dialysis during the daytime, but three meals like everybody else. At nighttime, usually around 10 o'clock at night, people will start using the cycler. So we have an abrupt influx of glucose from the cycler solutions starting at 10 o'clock at night. Lantus is moved to supper time so that it's effective. It's working when the cycler starts. And of course, we have to be really careful about that. We have to make sure before we do that that they're not too low already at bedtime. So if they're already too low at bedtime, we can't move that insulin to supper. You can see at 6 o'clock in the morning, the blood sugars are still high. But you also see from 6 o'clock to 8.30, the blood sugars drop quite a bit. So that's what I meant. We have to target uh, hyperglycemia associated with the dialysis solutions, but prevent hypoglycemia after that abrupt stop. And sometimes that's challenging. We've been using tiny doses of Humalog or our insulin very carefully, like two, maybe three units at the start of the cycler. We did do one continuous glucose monitor on a gentleman with type 1 diabetes. He would start the cycler with blood sugars of about 10 to 12, go down to 5 or 6 in the middle of the night. Sounds pretty good, except that's a postprandial blood sugar. The meter is reading higher than what's in the vein. So what does that mean? We don't want to induce hypoglycemia in the middle of the night, so we aim for slightly higher. And then he ended up with glucoses of 10 in the morning. This particular gentleman, though, uh, has a job where he's walking all day. When we tried to manage his cycler with Lantus, he kept having hypoglycemia all day long. Cut it back, add a little bit of R, and now he could go to work and he slept well and his morning blood sugars were lower. So how do we interpret non-fasting blood glucoses? These are Canadian clinical practice guidelines that suggest if it's safe to go four to seven pre-meal, but we've already established they're seldom pre-meal, five to 10 post-meal. The same clinical practice guidelines point out that we have a lack of evidence-based research where postprandial glucoses are the major objective of the studies. Uh, most of the studies have been conducted on preprandial glucose and A1C targets. So we've talked about this already, that PD patients have a postprandial period that lasts most of the day. For safety, we usually aim higher than 4 to 7. So it might be 5 to 10 or 5 to 8 AC meals if possible, 5 to 10 or 7 to 12 PC meals. How do we determine the accuracy of the home glucose meter? Lab meter comparisons. I have stopped asking people to go to the lab to do a fasting lab mat, uh, meter comparison. They have to fast from carbohydrate for about four, four and a half hours. So it doesn't have to be a 12 hour fast as it is with lipids. But nevertheless, we're still basing our judgments on postprandial glucose. So we, I've stopped asking them. Instead, we've started looking at how accurate the meter is or what does the meter tell us when we do a postprandial blood sugar. We have an article by a gentleman named George Sembrowski. This is courtesy of LifeScan, who points out that in the immediate postprandial period, when the glucose is getting into the blood from the gut, that a glucose meter may read up to 30% higher than the lab. And that's physiology, not a problem with the meter. So uh, we assume that the vein is going to have less blood glucose than the capillary blood. How do we interpret the A1C values? A lot of the diabetes, diabetologists will say that the A1C is inaccurate in chronic kidney disease. 
I don't think it's at all inaccurate. What's inaccurate is our assumption that glucose is the primary factor determining the A1C value. In renal disease, red blood cell physiology is a strong contributor. Also, the factors that affect the A1C are treatable. So this, again, is from the clinical practice guidelines. They point out the factors that raise the A1C. Acidosis is not really relevant for most patient populations, but it matters to us. Uh, I believe that acidosis may increase the rate at which the A1C molecule takes up glucose. A lot of our people have hypothyroidism, changes to red blood cell physiology, like iron deficiency anemia. Uh, this I thought was interesting. Most of the studies about A1C values were done on people who are Caucasian. If they're any other race but Caucasian, you could add 0.3 to 0.5 to the value and still say that's normal. Things that lower the A1C value are shortened lifespan of the red blood cell, erythropoietin agents, blood loss, and blood transfusions. This one I love. You'll see it on the, the trends, the hemoglobin was 78, and the very next day it was 91. And the patient will come in and say, look at that A1C. And I say, I'm not going to give you credit. We, you, you tested somebody else's red blood cells. You had a blood transfusion. <laughs> but if the physician should come up to me and say, hey, look at that A1C, I say, yeah, good, eh? This is nice. <laughs> so I'm choosy with where I send the credit. <laughs> So what I have on uh, our electronic chart, we can design the number, the test that we most want to look at. So what I have is what I call an A1C profile, the factors that most affect the A1C value. And we don't make the assumption that the glucose is random glucose or the, that glycemia is always the determining factor. Triglycerides, hypothyroidism, hyperparathyroidism, and vitamin D deficiency can increase insulin resistance. But it would be silly for me just to address the high A1C. We have to address the other factors as well. Iron studies, of course, you know, if they're iron deficient, we have to address that. White blood cell count, I always put that one in because I find that we, the white blood cell sometimes trends up a little bit before we notice that the person has an infection. There's a gentleman in the clinic right now who developed peritonitis but had an elevated white blood count for about two months before that. Yeah, and of course we wouldn't know then, was it coming from his feet, from his teeth? Where was the, the infection coming from? There's another test called fructosamine or glycated albumin. We can use that in hemodialysis. Their albumin levels might be low, but they're more stable. This test is based on an expected 20-day half-life of albumin. There are studies that suggest that it's accurate in hemodialysis. As you know, in peritoneal dialysis, our patients may use 5 to 15 grams of protein, including albumin, daily through the dialysis. And then we have to add the losses via the residual kidney function. So all we can say so far is that the half-life of albumin is variable and is probably a lot less than 20 days. Uh, we don't use that test very often. In fact, I've only seen it used a couple of times in the pre-care population, and neither one of those people had proteinuria. So to optimize blood glucose values, we have to consider all the factors. We do have one paper that says, obviously, um, if your blood sugars are always over 16 and the A1C is always over 8%, this was a study on peritoneal dialysis patients, that there's an increased rate of mortality. But it also states that moderate hyperglycemia it may not be adverse when it comes to studying mortality. And given that we're measuring postprandial blood sugars and the meter may read higher than the vein, uh, moderate hyperglycemia may not be as high as we maybe think it is. We do work with everyone. We have to work with the client and the family to figure out what's practical at home with the nephrologist, it no, doesn't make sense for one of us to adjust insulin and then find out they've changed the number of cycles in the cycler. It's best done together. Dietitian, because we're gonna be talking about how much carb the person 
knees, and she's going to be talking about how much albumin, real nurses, end oaks, uh, social workers, pharmacists, and family physicians. So Pat and I end up sending reports to everybody, a lot of people, family docs and endos. The rest, we're, we're assuming that the nephrologists read what we put on the Paris is what we're doing. I'll hand this over to Pat. At this point, I was going to get everybody to stand up, and, but I noticed that we, we have a break in a few minutes, so I think we can make it through. There's a, a guy in Houston, James Levine, a physician, and says that every hour you should stand up and move around for 10 minutes because sitting is the new smoking. So, and I know I sit way too much at my job. So if you feel the need to stand up, that, that I'm quite all right with that. <laughs> oh yeah, okay, good. <clears throat> Could do it in a wave, no. <laughs> Just a few minutes about the peritoneal membrane. Again, there's, there's starting to be more and more research emerging on, on what role, if any, uh, glycemia may actually play in the peritoneal membrane. And um, a recent review by Chu et al. You know, did say that glucose likely does have a detrimental effect on the peritoneal membrane, both from the systemic hyperglycemia that Sharon and I maybe ha are able to influence, and also from the local eff effects of the, you know, the hypertonic um, dialysate that's sitting at the membrane. So it does, I think, you know, it indicates that it is important to try to do our best with the glycemic management. And another thing that, that um, where parallels are obvious is when you look at the inflammatory markers of inflammation, both at the vascular endothelium and also in the peritoneal membrane, there's many common pathways that are influenced by glycemia. So again, the, the damage that's done long-term to the peritoneal membrane by inflammation um, may be um, not just because of the dialysate, but also because of uncontrolled hyperglycemia. Um, and we just need more research, a lot more research on what role glycemia might play. Let me just skip through. So we're just going to skip ahead. I'm going to mention continuous glucose monitoring. We'd actually hope to have some nice graphs to look at and to illustrate how continuous glucose monitoring is a very useful tool, especially in peritoneal dialysis. Um, but we don't have a continuous glucose monitor. So maybe some of you do. If we want to use CGM for our patients, we refer them to uh, an endocrinologist at the diabetes clinic and that is set up. Likewise, we have a couple of pharmacists in Calgary who have their own uh, continuous glucose monitors and charge patients $100, and they will do some CGM. So it's a very useful tool, and in fact, there's lots of studies looking at real-time real monitoring in specifically type 1 um, diabetes that show that people that use, that have, probably have pumps as well with um, continuous glucose monitoring, they can reduce their A1C more safely and it also reduces the frequency of hypoglycemia and reduces hypoglycemia unawareness. So I think it's a tool that we would like to use more and it certainly is out there. And with the, with the wave of people coming through now that, that have insulin pumps and the newer um, um, wireless connections between the, the continuous glucose monitoring and, and the pumps, um, we may be, seeing, be able to use this technology, we're hoping. So let's just spend a little bit of time, we're almost done, um, looking at what diabetes drugs are available to use in end-stage renal disease. And this um, graph, I think, is this from Yale in Montreal, yeah. Jean-Francois Yale, and basically it, it's uh, most of the different bodies giving recommendations for diabetes management, you know, they're all basically congruent with this. So maybe if we could just step, walk through the different medications and talk about do we use them and how much. Metformin, big controversial uh, medication. So most 
guidelines state that once your GFR is under 30%, it should not be used. And that's ba that goes back to research that said it would it increase the risk of lactic acidosis. But some of you may have read there was a big Cochrane review that looked at, at metformin and acidosis and found that it was actually a very, very rare complication and usually in the presence of other comorbidities. So uh, we are a little bit more liberal, and this is a nephrologist-driven uh, therapy. Uh, some nephrologists are very comfortable in our clinic uh, using metformin down to almost a GFR of 15%. If it is number one, if there's no evidence of metabolic acidosis, and if it is shown to be of benefit. So it's really good for people that are more insulin resistant. Um, once people get under 15%, it's usually is gone. But it's, I'm curious to know whether or not in a, in a PD population with all the postprandial glucose around, if something like this, because there's no other drug that really targets the liver in terms of managing glycemia, so it, it would be nice um, if we could use something like this. Glyburide, well, we're all pretty clear. We all stop it at 30%. Um, Glycoside, the sulfonylureas, uh, we tend to use these in decreasing doses down to maybe 15%. And we also make sure that we switch from the MR, long-acting preparations, to the shorter-acting drugs because, of course, it's metabolized to liver and partially renally or majority, I think, is renally excreted. So there could be potential for prolonged action of it. Glucanorm, repaglinide. We use this a lot in our CKD and dialysis populations. But we do know that once people become uremic and they get um, some, they start to lose their appetite, they're not eating well, they get to the dialysis point, that the starting dose of these medications may be much less. TZDs, um, don't use them at all. The DPP-4 inhibitors is a new class, of, is a class of drugs now that I think that's being increasingly used in our CKD and our dialysis populations, and I think just from the experience we've had, quite effectively. So um, citagliptin, uh, Genuvia, that usually requires some dose reduction. So once you're under 50%, you're knocking down to 50, I think, and then once you're to 30 or to 25 milligrams. And curiously, in Alberta, uh, Blue Cross covers the 100 milligram tabs, but for people needing 25 milligram tabs, there's no coverage. So how does that make sense? Anyway, so that's a bit of a quandary phase. So when we come to that point, then we look around to see, well, what is covered in this class of drugs? And usually uh, we're finding that we are using more and more linagliptin or Trigenta. Um, there is some evidence uh, that the company has done to show that it's safe to 30%. And then they've done some, I think, further research looking at 30 to 15 percent. There's really no research that looks at people under 15 percent or on dialysis. But um, we have found it to be uh, quite, quite effective and a nice adjunct to other oral or even insulin therapies. Um, loraglutide, um, we've had a few people come to us that are on Victoza that a family physician has put them on and they'll show up with a GFR of 8% and they're still on Victoza. And they're doing fine. So the question is, you know, it's way past our comfort level. So normally we'll stop it. M most of the nephrologists will stop the medication. Um, but I, just from an experience point of view, we haven't seen any real adverse effects of somebody being on it with that low kidney function. I think it's just an unknown. And then exanatide we're not using, and a carbos we don't tend to use. Um, the guidelines all say stop it at 25%. And then, of course, insulin, our friend, which is used extensively. Um, so basically the point of this is just to say that we do a lot of self-monitoring of blood glucose, pe asking people to test at least for periods of time, four times a day. And, um, and then we look at their glucose patterns and their PD prescriptions, and we try to match insulin, the insulin with the patterns that we see. So we use all of these insulins, 
and we try to use them strategically. And it's very hands-on, empirical kind of approach. And our, and, our, and our nephrologists are really helpful, and we work together with them and try to come up with good combinations. And so there's lots of questions. Lack of research, again, it's all empirically based therapy that, that we're doing with the insulin. And um, we're trying to prevent hypoglycemia, and I'll just skip over that. And these are some of the strategies um, in, ad in addition to the medications. So we, we try to maintain blood glucose overnight. So if they're not cycling and using, um, you know, 2.5 and 4.25%, um, they may need a snack. We aim for higher blood glucoses at bedtime, and we adjust the, the doses to prevent hypoglycemia. Um, we frequently move basal insulin. So if somebody comes into... Uh, the dialysis setting from the CKD setting and when they're stage four and five we have moved those basal insulins to the morning so that they're waning overnight as a one technique for preventing nocturnal hypoglycemia then they come to you and then maybe they do CAPD for a month so they're still good to have the basal in the morning and then a month or so later they're switching to the cycler overnight and so then we have to do that that flip again and we're flipping, maybe we may be flipping our basil again to the night. Or we may be using R. R is our friend in dialysis. R fall, has fallen out of favor with the advent of rapid insulins, but we like R because its duration of action is really up to eight hours, and the cycler is up to eight hours. So for people on those higher um, hypertonic glucose dialysates, it, it can be very effective, and sometimes it's a matter of two units of R, and that is enough. And then it's wearing off when the cycler shuts off, and we're avoiding that dip. So the risk of hypoglycemia is really high when your cycler shuts off. You have a period of time when, when you're actually, um, you still may have some insulin present, but no glucose coming in. So that's R is quite useful there. Um, the question of what, how to administer the insulin. And in Calgary, we really have no experience with the um, intraperitoneal um, administration of insulin, but I understand here that there are people that are using this, so I can't really speak to this um, with any knowledge. There some of the evidence in the research discourages it. I think it's one of the ADA, one of the guidelines um, tries to discourage it, and we do know that um, you need much larger doses for a variety of reasons. So again, it may be an option. Uh, whoops, wrong way. So I'd like to summarize that really we don't have any evidence-based research to give us specific management strategies in the dialysis setting but we are regularly extrapolating knowledge that we do have and working with members of our team to try to um, help patients achieve good glycemic control. And then we also have to consider those human variables which are really important, and that is what is a person willing to do. So people have dialysis, they've perhaps, or have diabetes, they've neglected their control for many, many years, have all kinds of um, challenging coping mechanisms, and they arrive at end-stage kidney disease and dialysis, and suddenly we're asking the, a lot of them. So it's a very gradual process, and um, we, it's very important. So you come up with your strategy, then you ask the person, what are you willing to do? And you have to start with whatever they're willing to do is where we have to start. And again, teamwork. Can't get past that. And individualize. So thank you. I'd just like to leave you with this last quote that, that just summarizes things, that there's many variables, factors that contribute to glycemic control. And we know that the requirements for insulin are not going to be easily pre predicted and that we must focus on individual vari variations and comorbidities to come up with an effective strategy. Thank you for your attention.